Amen. What a way to start our Sunday morning. <laughs> it is such a joy this morning to wake up on this Sunday morning with the sun that is shining. Not too windy, as you didn't have to be blown in here this morning. And so we are thankful. Welcome, welcome to Glenmar Church. We are so happy that you are here. It is not an accident, not a coincidence, not serendipitous even that you are here this morning. For God invited you this morning. God invited you to experience God's love and God's presence and God's joy and peace. And so you are here this morning uh, in this sanctuary. And this sanctuary extends to those who are joining at home as well. We are so thankful for the movement of the Spirit this morning. And I want you to know that if nobody told you this week, you matter. You matter. You belong. And God loves you immeasurably. And so we would also love to connect with you. And so um, you can check in with us this morning. And so you have friendship pads. If you're in the, in the building, there are friendship pads at the end of each row. Please pass them along and check in so that we can connect with you. And if you are joining us online, you can also click the check in button um, and so that we can know that you are here and connect with you. And also, if you have prayer requests, we would love to pray for you and with you. Um, and so let us know if you have any prayer concerns um, that we might be in prayer for you about this day. I wanted to also let you know that the altar flowers are in dedication to uh, James Dressner from Sarah Pagan for a birthday. Happy birthday, uh, James. We are uh, so happy for uh, your story um, that God has brought you uh, through these years. And so we are so thankful for you and happy birthday. And so this is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. So let us uh, continue our time of worship with our call to worship. Good morning. I'm Leslie Franson, and uh, I have a little bit extra husk in my voice today, but, but I'm, I'm very joyful to be here to uh, join you in worship. And I ask you now to please stand as you're able and remain standing following the call to worship for the, prayer, for the uh, opening hymn. <clears throat> How wonderful it is to be in a dwelling place for God. The refreshing springs of God's love and restore us. There is a place here for everyone. No one is turned away. The least and the lost, the homeless and hopeless are always welcome in God's house. Praise to God who invites and shelters us all. Praise to God who heals and sends us forth to serve. Amen.
Please be seated. Please join me in the prayer for the people. Father God, just as you orchestrated every detail of the death and burial and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, so that the prophecies in Scripture and your plan of salvation were fulfilled, we know that you are always also in control of our lives and that we are a part of your plan and you have a purpose for each one of us and that you love us and watch over us no matter where we are, just as you watch over the sparrows. You see us and you know us completely. When we go astray, when we try to be in control of our own lives or when our pride gets in the way, you give us uh, very appropriate lessons to learn to bring us right back to you where you want us to be. You are our creator and our sustainer and our almighty eternal God, holy and perfect in all your ways. Through the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus, you have prepared the way for us to become your beloved children. You hear us when we lift our prayers to you. We lift up to you now our prayers for those in our congregation in need of your healing touch and your strength and encouragement. We lift up Willa Brooks, Katie, the cousin of Gina Levin and Jamie Shart, Chris Wessels, Lola Barrick, Burley Edwards, Henry, the nephew of Ellen Burns, Avery, the six-year-old granddaughter of Sue and Jim Lyman, Cheryl Baker, and Joanne Milliner, who is scheduled for surgery soon. We ask for your protection over those who are undergoing cancer treatment. Bill Westervelt, Tommy, the brother of Don Chanet, Tony Taka, Shin Liang, Austin, the great nephew of Terry Hansen, and Debbie Albrecht. We pray that they will feel your presence with them moment by moment and know that you will never leave them. May they feel your strength and love pouring into them and be encouraged, and may they emerge victorious upon completion of their treatment. Father, we also pray for those around the world who are suffering and in great need of your intervention. Please guide us in knowing how we can be your hands and feet to those in need. Help us to be one with you and one with each other according to the example of our Lord. And now hear us as we pray the prayer our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
one of the most frustrating things is not being able to sing along with my favorite hymns. <clears throat> but that was beautiful, thank you. Um, the Old Testament reading today is from the Psalms, um, and it's Psalm 84. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, indeed it faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. At your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God, happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise. Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, and they, they make it a place of springs, the early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold our shield, O God, look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. He bestows favor and honor. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, happy is everyone who trusts in you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Amen. Amen. I wanted to ask, uh, raise your hand if you've ever seen The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> all right, double points if you've seen The Wiz. Have you seen The Wiz? All right, all right. So uh, then you will, this will speak to you. In the screen and Broadway adaptations of The Wiz, Diana Ross and or Stephanie Mills, depending on which version you saw, sings the song Home. And it starts by saying, when I think of home, I think of a resting place, a place where there's peace and quiet and serenity. And then they sing, when I think, I won't hurt your ears, when I think of home, I think of a place where there's love overflowing. I wish I was home, I wish I were back there for the things I've been knowing. And this song comes at the end when Dorothy uh, is at the end of her pilgrimage in Oz and her pilgrimage back home. For Dorothy, this can be uh, either the original uh, Wizard of Oz or Wiz, whichever one. But for Dorothy, she runs away from home because of some type of hurt, some type of trauma and or fear, and then goes on a pilgrimage in a distant place in search of home only to long to return home with fresh perspective or new eyes, a new home, a resurrected home. If you have never noticed, the Wizard of Oz and the Wiz are a lot like the parable of the prodigal son or the lost son. You know where the son leaves for whatever reason, goes to a distant country like Oz, has misadventures and then longs for home and then returns home. And that we understand in the parable of the prodigal or the lost son that this returning of home is an analogy for the kingdom of God. And so returning to the kingdom of God. And the truth is that we are all prodigals. All of us are prodigals who long for home. In fact, this longing for home is natural, that we are hardwired to desire home. It's even a part of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. From the time we are expelled from the womb, we begin our pilgrimage home. From the time we leave the home that is our mother's womb, we begin our journey into the distant place we call the world, and we long for a place called home. And as Luther Vandross said, a house is not a home. So this longing for a home is not necessarily a physical place, though we do need shelter. But what we're longing for is a place, a home, a place of serenity, of protection, of belonging, where we can discover our purpose, where we develop relationships and where our basic needs are met a place of peace and love. Humans are not the only ones who also have a necessity for home. All of creation longs for home. Even the creatures of the air like the sparrows and the swallows. Everything longs for a home and builds a nest to find and create home. So it is no wonder that from the start of when we are born that we are in search for home. When we think about this innate need, can we think about the profound crisis that it is to be unhoused, to be homeless? Yet, as many of us sit here this morning, many of us may not face the crisis of being unhoused, yet many of us face the crisis of being homeless. And when I'm talking about the being in the thralls of this homelessness, I'm talking about the search for home mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. In fact, many of us came here this very morning or last week or at some point came to Glenmar in search for home where God's love would be found overflowing. Let us pray. Gracious God, 
we are thankful that your eyes are fixed upon us. For just as your eyes are upon the sparrow, so too are your eyes on your beloved. We thank you that in you we have been found and a home is found in you. Help us to not be marauders along our pilgrimage, but that we might be co-builders and co-laborers who construct refuge along the way. Help us welcome your beloved home so that no one be unhoused or homeless, but found safe to dwell in your presence forever. Prepare us, O oh God, to be living sanctuaries. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. It's the sentiment of Dorothy, and it is really the sentiment of the prodigal. And surely it is the sentiment of our psalm reading this morning. Now, while the psalm reading this morning does not explicitly list David as the author, it is believed by scholars that it is written by David because it sounds a lot like his other psalms. David in this morning's psalm reading is longing to be home, to be in God's presence. David says, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My song longs, indeed it faints for the courts of the Lord. Faints for the court of the Lord. Faints. That is profound longing. His longing turns to a bit of jealousy towards the sparrow and the swallow who are able to find home for not only themselves but for their young at the altar of the Lord. Oh, how I wish I could be like that lonely sparrow or swallow so that I can be in your presence, O oh God. If only I could be like the young sparrow or the swallow who have a nest at the altar of the Lord. For everyone who lives in in the house of the Lord is happy, whole, singing praises and have strength. A day in your courts, or even adjacent to it, to be in the inner part of the house is better than a thousand days elsewhere. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield who gives favor and honor. This is deep longing. David was longing to go home and be home in the Lord. Let me be even the sparrow, for I know you are watching over me. Your eyes are on the sparrow, and I know you are watching. If only I could click my heels three times and be in your house, O oh God, for there's no place like home. The truth is that many of us long for home because many of us grew up in houses but did not grow up in a home. Many of the houses for which we grew up were filled with dysfunction and toxicity and harmful family systems, abuse and vengefulness. And so while we have not been unhoused, and yet some of us have faced that as well, we have been homeless. Some of us grew up in big, stunning houses, yet were homeless. Some of us never experienced a place of peace and serenity or love. Some of us didn't get that sense of purpose or belonging, nor were our basic needs met. Some of us weren't given self-esteem and didn't necessarily feel protected. Some of us never felt that we belonged or developed those crucial relationships. Some of us even fled from home to go on a pilgrimage to find home or to create our own nest, to create our own home. And sometimes we're able to take that longing and create spaces of home, and yet some of us discover the wounds that are still open from having been homeless mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And just sometimes that dysfunction we were running from comes with us and destroys our homes. And well, if you didn't know, this is the story of David. If you've ever felt that no one could have a more dysfunctional or toxic household, 
I asked, have you heard of David's family? His household was a hot, hot mess. <laughs> it was filled with dysfunction and toxicity. And for him to be the king, the boy who defeated the Goliath, the one who had a heart after God's own, whose house was a palace, his home, his house certainly didn't seem like a home. It was a hot, 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 hot mess. So I want you to sit back for a moment and let me tell you a bit about the drama that is David's house. You may have asked yourself, why is David longing to be in God's dwelling place? Where is he? David is longing to be in God's presence, to be in the tabernacle or temple in Jerusalem where God dwells because he is on a run. He had to leave Jerusalem because his third son, Absalom, was after him and wanting to unalive him. So in the midst of David finding himself on the run from death, he calls on God as the Lord of hosts. See, this title is significant because it is a title associated with God's presence. God's presence with God's people. The Lord of hosts, who is a living God, who is the giver of life. God is the source of life like the sun and its shield, who is the protector of life. So David, who was on the run from death, calls upon God to be a life giver and to be a protector, to be a refuge in his very present trouble in the midst of him being unhoused and homeless. He calls on God to be a shelter and a refuge because there's no place like home. But we cannot ignore the family drama. We cannot ignore that behind those beautiful words of longing to be home, that David is on the run because his son has started a rebellion and trying to unalive him. So just in case you thought that's what you heard, you heard what you heard. And you may wonder why would anyone want to unalive David, the man after God's own heart? Why would his son not only be angry with him, but so enraged that he not only wanted to harm him, but to have him to cease to exist? Complicated family systems. Dysfunctional family systems. See, Absalom, whose name meant peace, ironically, was enraged. He was enraged because of the assault that happened to his sister Tamar by his brother Amnon. See, Amnon had violated her and sent her away to carry the burden of his shame as her own, leaving her to be unhoused and homeless. Needing refuge, she moved into Absalom's house who protected her. And while King David was angry with Amnon, for the horrific assault that he committed on Tamar, he didn't actually address it. There was no punishment of Amnon. And so Absalom said, well, I know what I'll do. I'll take revenge on my brother. And that's exactly what he did. And then he became unhoused and homeless. And see, it doesn't stop there. So this story has more twists and turns than a Lifetime movie. David allows him to Absalom to then come back to the house, but says, but you can't see me. Was John Cena can't see me? <laughs> David allows him to come back to the house, but says that you can't be home. Absalom absolutely longed to be in his father's presence. And he really wanted to see and experience David's love that was overflowing to protect him and to be a refuge and I'm sure for Absalom, it still felt like he did not. Though I believe that David believed that he was. So finally, David allows for Absalom to be in his presence. What it was that Absalom was looking for all along, yet by this time it was too little too late. Malice had already covered his heart and he conspired to unalive David. Absalom turned 
the hearts of the Israelites against David and planned to overthrow the throne by violence. So David fled, and he became unhoused and homeless. See? Hot mess. <laughs> All of them desired to be home, yet ended up being participants in its destruction. All of them longed to be home and wanted to be protected and cared for and valued and loved to find peace, but instead found themselves unhoused and homeless in a distant place, mind, body, and spirit. And in his rage, Absalom was lost. In Amnon's lust and power, he was lost. And for a time, David was lost due to fear. And this situation seemed that resurrection was an impossibility. Their household was in shambles, that the functions of their family systems were leading them to the tomb. The stone was rolled closed upon that tomb. And resurrection seems like it can't happen. There's not a place like home in God's dwelling place the kingdom of God. See, the truth is that some of us may have felt a bit like Absalom at times, felt unprotected, felt unloved, not cared for, and there has been a rage that we have been carrying with us, like baggage. Many of us have even felt like David, who was betrayed by someone close to us, someone that we loved, someone that was a family member, someone that we would least suspect and felt like we needed to run away. All of us at some point have been in situations with family or loved ones that seem that resurrection was impossible, that home was beyond repair and that there was no chance of new life. For many of us, we are living in our own lifetime movie situations. And the family systems around us are a hot mess. Our relationships with our parents might be a hot mess. Our spouses might be a hot mess. Our children might be a hot mess. Our families might be a hot mess. And even down to the pets <laughs> might be a hot mess. And perhaps you are carrying the pain of someone that you love that has turned on you. Someone close to you that has betrayed you or the people you expected, the protection that did not give it to you. And you look around and there's chaos all around you. And we look and we sit on these beautiful couches and we have these beautiful architecture houses and we have fine china to eat upon and nice clothes that are hanging in the closets and on the outside. Everything looks like the recipe for home. And yet we find that it's just a house. And you wonder if you should just run away. Relationships with parents and siblings and spouses and or children are volatile. There are power plays at work, being put down, abased, and ashamed. Maybe you're an outsider in your family system, and there are barriers in place so that it seems too impenetrable and just seems that nothing can be resurrected. And there is chaos roaring in your home. And it feels like it's being destroyed, and there is nothing that can save it. And so you feel lost. You feel lonely, discouraged, disconnected, despondent, disregarded. And in a house full of people, you feel completely isolated. You feel that you are without a home and longing for heaven to touch your house, that it might become a home. If you didn't know, you can be homeless in a house. And so you cry out, remember me, your sparrow. Watch over me that my cries turn into a song of freedom. Some of us have come here this very morning crying in our spirit, longing to be found and at home, to be reminded that God is watching over us, to be reminded that we, Easter people, share in the resurrection of Christ. For even the Good Fridays of our lives is met with the victory that is Easter. What had died in our lives is being resurrected and made new. 
There's no place like home. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My song longs and deep faints for the courts of the Lord. Can I have a moment of candor with you for a moment? Is this a place I can keep it real, right? The truth is that far too often the churches we have come to have been just as dysfunctional as the houses that we've come from. Filled with power plays and politics, we have felt either like Absalom that the church has not been a refuge but a place and not a place that protects the vulnerable, the oppressed or the marginalized, that ignores injustice, It's been a house of abuse. Or perhaps we felt like David, where the people that we expected to be instruments of love instead felt like people who wanted to bring us harm. It hurts more when it comes from the people that you expect to love you. It hurts more when it comes from a place that is supposed to be home. And far too often we find in the church people vying for position and putting together rebellions to get it. There are gatekeepers that say who is in and who is out, gatekeepers that put up barriers making it hard to gain access, have all these unwritten rules to follow that keep seeming to change, little rebellions and cliques all around in silos so that there's no real sense of belonging. And so the house of God far too often has become a mere beautiful building and not a dwelling place of the Lord. We have these beautiful architectured buildings with mahogany pews and beautiful chairs, and we have intricate, some churches have intricate stained glass windows, and we have these beautiful sound systems and special effects, yet there is deep poverty of connections and relationships. And so the beautiful places that look good on the outside, no one wants to come in and sit. A chair is just a chair. A pew is just a pew. Sending people away from what should be the dwelling place of God to sojourn or to go on a pilgrimage to be in search for home, leaving people to feel spiritually homeless. The people know that there is no place like home, though. But far too often they've peeked behind the curtain. They've come through the doors and seen behind the curtains and have not found God, but found a fake wizard. They leave hurt and disappointed looking for home somewhere over the rainbow, believing that home is God's dwelling place as a future hope over the rainbow because the state of the church seems like it's beyond repair, beyond resurrection today. There was actually a study in the Pew Research Center that said that eight out of 10 Americans say that religion is losing its influence in public life. And they expressed discontentment in that. And it also talked about how they didn't have affiliations with the church, and yet when you read behind the lines, it sounds like they wish that they could be. They are lamenting as they see the churches fall from grace. The people feel badly that they do not have these connections and longing to be in God's dwelling place because they know, they know probably even better than we do what the church is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a home of grace. It's supposed to be a means of grace. See, John Wesley, in describing our threefold understanding of grace, uses a house as an analogy because grace is the dwelling place of God's love and we are invited without price. And that's why when the church is anything other than that, people are profoundly hurt and disappointed and left to be homeless. I I remember once uh, when I was working for a church, I'm not going to name any names, I was an admin in my 20s at this particular church. And there was this one particular uh, day, a phone call came in, and it was someone who was asking for help with their rent and they were facing eviction. And I was so excited to share this with the deacons to say, look, this is an opportunity that we can help. And instead, they checked to see if the person requesting was a tithe payer. And the policy was, 
If a person wasn't, they couldn't get help. The irony that the house of God would not help someone with their housing. What about grace that is without price? Some of our churches have not been a sanctuary, but a building. And so we have sent people unhoused and homeless. Let our churches not be a building, but a sanctuary. Let us who have been found not be gatekeepers, but living sanctuaries for God. The house of God is a dwelling place for all that had been lost and now found and at home. Just as David was able to return and find home back in God's dwelling place, we know that each day is a new grace, a new mercy, a new opportunity for resurrection. For whatever situation we have come in here today with, whatever seems to be decaying in your life, whatever situations you are in that makes you feel bound, isolated, and alone, that are making you feel that you do not belong, whatever makes you feel locked up inside, Whatever feels that is dead in us, know that we are followers of Jesus who overcame the grave. We are followers of Jesus who overcame sin and death. We are followers of Jesus who got the victory over the chaos and the dysfunctions of our lives, the dysfunctions of our family systems. We are followers of a resurrected God. We are Easter people who are invited to live resurrected lives. So whatever has made you feel lost, know that you have been found. And in you, God dwells, and so home is in you today. God dwells in you, and you, and you, in me, in all of us. So that in this gathering this morning, in this place is home, God's dwelling place, a sanctuary. We are a sanctuary where God dwells. It's not the building. It's not the building, though this is a beautiful building. This is God's dwelling place. We are home today, and there's No place like home. Each day, the church also has a new mercy to live as resurrected people in the body of Christ. In you this day is the church, resurrected as Easter people through your hearing of this today. So let our churches be resurrected, leaving the power plays, the gatekeeping, the exclusion, the harm, the abuse, the hatred, the violence, and all the deathly systems. Leave them in the tomb. Leave them in the pit of the grave because Jesus overcame it all. Church, we are a resurrected body, living sanctuaries where all are found home. So Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving, I'll be a living sanctuary for you. One more time, church. Or prepare me to be a sanctuary. oh God, to be living sanctuaries where God dwells and all are found home. Thanks be to God. And thank you, Sophie, for backing me up. (laughs) Singing is not my gift. (laughs) 
I don't know if this week that um, you got to see the pastor's ponderings. Um, I got to be the guest uh, pastor in writing this week. And in the case that you are not, uh, haven't signed up for pastor's ponderings, I encourage you to. Um, but I got to share what I believe is an illustration of what it is to be a living sanctuary. Glenmar folks got to demonstrate that in partnership with uh, Ames United Methodist Church in Sandtown. If you don't know that uh, they had acquired a warehouse some time ago, and they had all these other plans to, to do different things with it. And they had also gotten a grant to be able to fix a, a wall in their church and to, to do some work, and the wall collapsed. And then the building itself was not sound, and so it ended up having to be condemned. And so they had to figure out what to do, and it seemed like an impossibility. It seemed like, how can we resurrect a sanctuary in the midst of this? But let me tell you what God can do. And so just four or five weeks ago, they decided to turn the warehouse into a sanctuary. Just four or five weeks ago. How is that possible? And if you didn't get to see, you know, there, in the pastor's pond, and there are some really cool pictures they were able to do that with the help of folks from the mission board who helped in the building. And it was about, and that was about a couple dozen of Glenmar folks that helped with it. And then it was just about six or seven that helped over the last few weeks. One of them being uh, Pat, who did a lot of work, and Eloise, I understand, did a lot of work too. And on this morning, I believe, after seeing the 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 building and what they were able to do, they are in their sanctuary. That's what it means <laughs> to be living sanctuary. And it is through your giving that we are able to do things like that, that we are able to be the hands and the feet of God, that we are able to go out and be living sanctuaries, that we all might share the gospel that invites us to be found and to be home. And so, this giving, may it be used as instruments and gifts of God's love. Let us pray for the offering that will be received. Gracious God, we gather as your living sanctuaries this day, filled with gratitude for the love and the light that you have shown us we thank you that your eyes are on your sparrows and that you invite us to be in your dwelling place, to be sanctuaries for your glory. May these gifts that are given be a reflection of the love we have experienced in Christ and our commitment to live resurrected Easter people lives for the work of your kingdom. Use these offerings, O oh God, to bring justice and mercy and hope to the world in need. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Ushers, you may come forward.
please join me in the closing prayer. Father, we thank you for the great joy and privilege we have had in coming together in this place to worship and to learn from you. We thank you for your gift of salvation in Jesus Christ, for your word, for your church, and most especially for your never failing love, grace, and mercy. Help us to be ever mindful as we leave this place that you have called us to be your ambassadors to a hurting world. Help us to love one another as you have loved us so that others may know we are new creations in you. Help us in every way we can to draw others to seek you. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I just have um, two announcements, and so usually I would say you can be seated, but it's just two. Um, <laughs> um, two things to be aware of um, that are coming up is that Glenmar's Rally for Life Team Angels for the Cure will be in the gathering place today to collect donations for the American Cancer Society. They will also take orders for luminaria, 
in honor or in memory of someone who has had cancer. The relay will be held on Saturday, June 1st. Please uh, see their table. Also, there is a new member class that is coming up on Sunday, May 5th at 12.30. It's a lunch with the pastors and new members class for people who want to join Glenmar Church. We would love to meet with you in person for lunch, and it's on us. So bring your hunger and talk about what it means to be a member at Glenmar Church. So sign up on RIM or search Lunch with the Pastors on the website. So go, my friends, this day. Go out as living sanctuaries. Go into the world finding home and love in all the ways that you discover that God is among us, that there is a dwelling place in each and every one of us. So go, my friends, in the name of God, our Father, Christ, our Redeemer, and Holy Spirit of love. Amen.